Hey guys, Chaps here. Today I've got another Horde video for you. Recently we put out three videos discussing Horde mode and what we would like to see changed. Our group's done many 1 to 50 no fails on Insane, and we've given a brief overview of our setup in some of the previous videos. Due to some questions that have come up, this video today is going to give a more in-depth discussion on how we set up. I'm going to talk about the setup and the roles that we play in a run. I'm going to avoid talking about point boosting and techniques to get more points. This video is just intended to give an overview of some nice strategies for completing 1 to 50 runs. This strategy is by no means the perfect strategy, and it's not the only strategy to use. This is just one that my team's been using a lot, and it works out really well for us, so I thought I'd share. If you missed these previous videos I mentioned, be sure to check them out on our channel. The links are in the description below. Before we start a match, the first thing to look at is our class setup. Our scout's going to run a deposit bonus, a pickup radius, a health boost, and then whatever else they want. The engineer is going to run repair efficiency, turret cost, sometimes turret health, and then whatever they want. Our heavy classes are going to run spot damage, turret damage, turret capacity, and then the remaining ones are going to be whatever they want. They're probably going to throw in the pistol expert and maybe a mortar strike. If we have a soldier class, they're going to be running hammer strike. Besides that, they're pretty much just going to pick whatever they want. It's probably going to be something grenade related and or assault rifle related. The last class is sniper. If we have one of these, which is pretty rare, they're going to have headshot and critical damage, precision capacity, and whatever else they want it's probably going to end up being explosive headshot and then something else. Traditionally, we run one scout, one engineer, two heavies, and a soldier. Every once in a while, we'll mix up the heavy and soldier thing, but for the most part, that's what we run. Now that we have our classes chosen, let's take a look at the setup location. Here's a few images showing where we typically set up. For the most part, we tend to look for locations with long, narrow lanes. Because of the way the maps are set up, this normally tends to be back towards one of the spawns. The main aspect that we like about these locations are the limited access points. By funneling the enemies into a narrower area, we're better able to focus fire. The secondary aspects that we look for are cover and hand advantage. Having right hand advantage is a minor improvement, and it's not crazy important, but it's something nice to look at. Cover though is a pretty big one. Boom shots, drop shots, and rockets are some of the most dangerous aspects in Horde, especially on Insane. Finding a covered area or a place with a crossing beam plays a big role in stopping some of the incoming projectiles. The other aspect that might not be quite as obvious is the back wall. Maps like Dam do a great job of showing this. Imagine if we had turrets set up back here. If a boom shot, rocket, or drop shot comes in and overshoots, what's going to happen? It's going to hit the wall and kill us. Now if we set up on this side, it just goes right over the edge. This is a really nice aspect to keep in mind. Of course the lanes are the primary thing we look for, but cover is definitely an important one to keep in mind when picking a spot. Now that you've got a setup location, it's time to get started. Let's talk fortifications. The first thing that we're going to do is save up for a turret. Turrets are going to be the key. When we are able to buy the turret, we're probably going to use our heavy to buy it. This is going to give us the increased turret ammo capacity. Many people would choose engineer because of the decreased cost, but the fabricator upgrades faster as you spend money, and we want to upgrade it as quickly as possible. So we normally try to use our heavy here instead of the engineer. So I say this, but recently we've actually been using our engineer to buy it, We've been able to upgrade our fabricator pretty quickly, and it is nice saving that little bit of money. And the engineer has been having about an 80% turret health increase, and that is huge. I'd say that the turret health increase is definitely better than the ammo capacity. You should be getting this first turret around wave 4. We've gotten it as early as 3, and I think the latest we've gotten is probably 5 or 6. Next, a couple waves later, we'll be buying a second turret. After that, we're going to be buying some fences. Depending on the map, you're going to need 2 to 3 to block things off. When setting up fences, there's two main aspects to keep in mind. One, when they're set up, you want them to block enemies in your line of sight. If you're blocking enemies and they're not in your line of sight, all the fence is doing is slowing them down and wasting money. The second one sort of goes along with the first, and that's make sure that you're able to kill anything touching your fences. This is either you doing it on turrets or having sentries placed there. You don't want trackers coming in and just wrecking your fences because they're just going to sit there and spin up until your fence is destroyed. If you can't see the tracker, it's just going to kill your fence. By the time you reach rank 10, you should be set with your fences and about 3 turrets. Some of your turrets might even be rank 2 by then. Every once in a while, we'll have all 4 of our turrets rank 2 by the time we hit wave 10. It's really nice. It's important to note that we want to use our engineer to upgrade these turrets. Upgrading fortifications doesn't count towards your fabricator rank, and our engineer has that nice discount, so we're going to use him for all of the upgrades. Now depending on the map, we're either going to build a sentry turret or another man turret. 
If the map has a side section that's less protected, like the back stairs on Gridlock or the side stairs on Reclaimed, we're going to want that sentry. It will help cover that section, so most of your people can focus on the main section. If you're on a map like Fallout, Harbor, or Impact with a large singular lane, then you're just going to have another man turret. By wave 15, you should definitely be set up with all of your man turrets, some fences, and probably some sentries. At this point, you're essentially just going to build whatever you want. We normally tend to stick with the shock and kinetic sentries, as well as a few fences. We just want to spend as much money as possible in the fabricator to unlock the next tier. Every time you level up your fabricator, just go upgrade those man turrets. You may have recognized that this is just a very turret heavy strategy. I mean, these things just melt through enemies, and it's the best thing that we've found. On the topic of turrets, let's talk about placement. This is something that's going to take some getting used to, but it's extremely important. The main thing that's going to be hurting or downing you when on a turret are the boom shots and drop shots. You never want to lose trigger time, so you want to make sure that you don't have one projectile take out two people at once. Depending on the map, we either use a linear pattern or a checker pattern. Sometimes it's a combination in between. This ensures that revives are easily available and that a single explosive won't take out two of us at once. It may seem like a small aspect, but it makes a big difference, especially on the higher waves. Alright, so that's going to cover the basics of fortifications. Now let's look at the roles that each of the team members will be playing, as well as some of the more detailed strategy points. First, let's look at the Heavy class, one of the easiest classes to explain. This class gets first priority on the turret. They're just a powerhouse who's going to be mowing things down. That's all there really is to say about the Heavy. Next up is the Soldier. These guys normally get second dibs on the turret. The only real saving grace for this class is their Hammer of Dawn Strike, so don't be afraid to use it. We'll traditionally use it on Wave 40, and depending on how our money situation's going, we'll use it on 49. By the end, we've normally saved up quite a bit of money, so we're able to use a bunch on 49 and 50. It makes those last few waves go by really quickly, and they're extremely easy. The Sniper is rarely used by our team, but it can come handy every once in a while. The Sniper's primary role is going to be to take out the Scions at long range. These guys can really do some damage, so it's nice to get them out of the way ASAP. Next, we have the Engineer. The Engineer is going to be in charge of upgrading fortifications, repairs, and buying fences and sentries. Typically, the Engineer is going to be the only one to buy sentries. This is going to be to help them increase their score. They're very under-rewarded when it comes to scoring, so any additional sentry kills are going to help out a lot. It may be boring to some playing as the Engineer in lower waves, but once you get up to the higher waves, it's quite a bit of work. Make sure things stay repaired and make sure your team doesn't run out of ammo. It's a lot of work. In addition, on the higher waves, the Engineer will be the only person not on a turret, so this makes them the designated team medic. Last, but certainly not least, is the Scout. This one has a lot more team strategy in place. As you hopefully know by now, the Scout is the money maker. They earn double energy if they collect mid-wave. When the enemy count drops to 5, we have everyone hop off their turrets in order to slow down the killing. Now the Scout has some time to run around the map and pick up that energy. Note that this is also a good time to go pick up ammo boxes if you're low on ammo. At this time, communication is key. Everyone needs to be communicating to specify which enemies are alive and where they are. This is going to allow the scout to avoid the enemies while at the same time having the rest of the team slowly pick off the enemies until there's only one left. There's a few keys that will help in ensuring that you get the most money possible. First up, watch those fences and sentries. When there's only a few enemies left, we tend to turn sentries around or just pick them up. We also pick up the fences most of the time. This is going to stop the fences and sentries from prematurely killing the last enemy. Next, make sure you use downs wisely. When drones and similar enemy types are left, down them. This is going to give you some additional time to collect energy. After about 20 seconds of being down, have someone do an extended execution on them. This is going to give you even more time to collect some money. Lastly, use that end of round roll nicely. Your pickup bonus doesn't end until you're no longer moving. Once the last enemy dies, be sure to mantle, roll, vault, or whatever you can to get that one last push for some extra cash. The last topic I wanted to hit on were boss waves. Honestly, these play out pretty much just like any other wave for us, with a pretty small difference. As soon as the wave begins, we all call out what boss type we see. Depending on how confident we are with the map and boss combo, we're either going to focus solely on it, or kill some adds first. If we're confident in our ability for the combo, we're going to focus all fire on the boss and make sure to take it out as quickly as possible. This could potentially spawn the second boss for us to kill, which is going to earn us a lot more money. If we aren't too confident, we're going to try and kill some of the smaller guys, so that when the boss dies, another one doesn't spawn for us. Once the boss gets in good view, or we've killed enough of the adds, we're going to focus all fire on it, and the sentries are going to take care of the little guys for us. If a boomshot or dropshot sign appears, we're typically going to have one person shift fire to that enemy, so that it doesn't completely wreck us. When the wave is almost over, it's extremely important to have the scout get out there and grab that money. This is the highest earning wave, so grabbing money can really do a great job in helping you upgrade those fortifications. 
So yeah, that pretty much covers it. Be sure to set up your skills to complement your team's playstyle. Pick a point on the map that has clear lanes and is hopefully safe from incoming projectiles. Be smart when building fortifications, the turrets are your friend, and be sure to use your class skills. Working as a team to use skills properly goes a long way. If you feel that I missed anything, let me know in the comments below. If you have any questions, hit me up on Twitter, or hey, hit up any of our team on Twitter, or let us know in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, be sure to drop it a like, it would be much appreciated. Hopefully this video will help all of you out with your 1-50 to runs for those nice achievements, and until next time, thanks for watching. Hey, so it looks like you guys made it to the end of the video. As a thanks for sticking around and a thanks to our viewers for watching, here's a couple free codes for you.